Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you. We're grateful to you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, with your power, for your power, for your authority, for your sovereignty over all things. We dedicate this day to you, this morning to you. I dedicate this teaching to you that you might be glorified. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open uh, our, our spirits to receive whatever you have for us today. Lord, move, transform us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, is it up there? Oh, good, something's working. All right, so we've been going over, um, or we're in the series, Hope is Here, and I know Pastor Hector shared with you last week that uh, he was done with the, with the series, but I, I'm, uh, you know, pulling a, uh, extra innings on him here, and uh, kind of uh, tagging on to that theme a little bit, but w- with a little bit of a, a shift. Uh, we're heading into Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. I don't know if any of you feel the same way. Uh, you know, when I look at uh, Christmas, it's so commercialized. And I, even Easter, you know, with all the bunnies and the eggs and everything else, I know it's the, you know, resurrection of Jesus, but it's, it's kind of gotten all watered down. But, you know, they, it seems like the marketers tend to kind of leave Thanksgiving alone a little bit because they're heading, you know, heading to Christmas. And uh, so I, I kind of like Thanksgiving because it's, it's still kind of less commercial and more pure. And this particular Thanksgiving is, is pretty special. Uh, this, this month, this Thanksgiving, is the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving that we celebrate, the 400th anniversary in the fall of 1621. Now, the Thanksgiving holiday and the story behind it is uh, fairly familiar to those, who have, uh, those of us who have grown up in American schools. Uh, those who have grown up in other countries, especially non-European countries, may be somewhat mystified and maybe confused about this holiday and the, the people that we call pilgrims. But even those of us who have grown up in public schools, maybe, uh, maybe we don't know as much as we uh, think we know uh, because we've really been taught incorrect traditions. Uh, we've also been taught revisionist history. Uh, so we really don't know uh, these people very well. Um, this is where the Holy Spirit said, okay, now I'm on. So uh, let's, uh, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 14, verse 1 through 12. And because there are so many verses, and because it was last minute, I didn't have time to, to put it up. But if you have your Bibles or the, your Bible on your cell phone, uh, you can turn to that. Exodus chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pi-Haharoth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal-Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. And I think the implication there is that they had gone farther than that, and God is telling them, no, turn back. I want you to come back. Actually, retrace your steps and come back a little bit, back towards Egypt. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. In other words, they're confused. They don't know which way they're going. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, 
his horsemen and his army and overtook them, camping by the sea beside pi Haharoth, before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be out in the middle of the desert? All you knew was being a slave in Egypt. And you trusted this, this man. And you saw miracles and, and things, and that was great. But it's kind of like, well, that's what you did yesterday. What are you going to do for me today? And this leader led you to a certain place, hit a dead end, and was coming back. And now the Egyptians are coming, and your back is against the sea. What kind of feelings, what kind of emotions must have been stirred up? Fear, obviously. Uncertainty. Perhaps even hopelessness. You know, there's a lot going on in our world right now. And... It can be pretty overwhelming. It can kind of make us feel like, you know, that, you know, like, like we're up against the Red Sea, our back's against the sea, and everything's coming at us, and there's no escape. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. You know, I, um, you look at what's going on in, you know, France and Australia and Austria and New Zealand and elsewhere, it's just crazy. And we've got it tough, but they've got it even tougher. Their backs are against the wall. Well, at, at the risk of seeming like I'm getting political, I'm not. And if you'll be patient with me, you'll see. I'd like to tell you about another nation that I know of. In this nation, there's a lot of turmoil and division going on in that society. Its civil government has gained more and more power over the years, leading to corruption. It claims to be the friendly benefactor of the people, but makes decisions and policies that benefit the government and hurts the people. Its civil government has made unreasonable laws that are making it more and more difficult to live there. Those who stand for their rights are considered to be and treated as enemies of the state. Christians and churches are especially feeling the oppression of that civil government, which is claiming authority over religious institutions as well, and saying that non-compliant churches can't meet. Also, for the health of society, churches and Christians aren't being allowed the free exercise of their religious practices and expression. Believers and churches are threatened. If they don't restrict their activities in church, they might face fines and jail. Some pastors are standing up to the civil government and insisting on leading their churches according to the Bible and the dictates of their conscience. Unfortunately, they've been threatened with jail time and fines for doing so. Those neighbors that agree with the civil government's actions don't understand why some won't comply, ridiculing them and blaming them for the problems. And sadly, there is division, not only in that society, but also within its church. Some Christians believe the scriptures command them to obey the civil government no matter what, and feel that they should obey its restrictions. 
Other Christians feel that they need to stand against the civil government and its oppressions and stand for the biblical rights and not accept the way things are. And there is an exodus of people who have left their cities and moved to other areas for what they hope will be a better life. Many of those who remain are considering doing so in the future. Now, like I said, don't panic. You may think this, this was a political statement. What I just read to you, I, I was trolling you a little bit, okay? If you know what trolling is. I was trolling you a little bit to kind of pull you in. What I just described was the condition of our Christian brothers and sisters in England in the early 1600s our Puritan forefathers. They were experiencing much of what we experience here today. During this service, we've been talking about hope, and Pastor Hector has shared encouraging messages of hope for those who are weary, those who are broken, the underdog and the doubter, but how do we find hope when the source of our discouragement isn't internal? but comes from the external circumstances of our society that seem so overwhelming. How do we find hope when all hope seems lost? For some, our world can seem pretty dark right now. Maybe some of you. And I'd like to speak to those folks today. And if that's not you... If you're just a happy camper and everything's great and you know, hunky-dory, well, maybe I'll at least get a little bit of a history lesson today. But unlike the sunrise picture that we've seen throughout this hope series, the world can seem, for some, so dark that our hope can seem like one small candle barely piercing the overwhelming darkness that surrounds us. Our hope, perhaps like a candle in the wind, is still lit, but poised to be snuffed out with the next blast of discouragement. Do you ever, does your heart ever cry out to God? Do you ever cry out to God and say, God, I'm at the end. I can take no more. When, God, when? When are you going to step in like the children of Israel with their backs against the sea? saying we would have been better off being slaves in Egypt. No, they wouldn't. But that's how they felt. Is your back against the sea? David, he cried out to the Lord. He said, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? having sorrow in my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? He says, oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. Return, O oh Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. You know, hope, hopelessness is a very dark place indeed. And in the book of Job, we find out that Job experienced this type of hopelessness as well. Uh, You know, when things got really bad, he said, but when I hoped for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. And in Proverbs 13, 12, we learn that hope deferred or hope delayed makes, actually makes the heart sick. I'm hoping, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Uh, come on, God. C- c- come on, we need your deliverance. We, we need an answer. And over time, your heart begins to get sick. But there is a promise that when that desire is finally fulfilled, it is a tree of life and will be a tree of life. In Psalm 27, 13, it says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see 
the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, God has made promises of a hope and a future. In Jeremiah chapter 29, we, we see, for I, uh, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for a welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And in Proverbs 23, it says, Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. So God has made these promises of a hope and a future. But are they promises for us as well? Are they promises that we can claim for ourselves? Or were these, were these specifically just promises for this particular, you know, for the time in which they were spoken? I'd like to share with you about the pilgrims. The pilgrims are a model of those people who also faced hopelessness and questioned their future. Now, time won't allow for a, a full history uh, uh, on the pilgrims. I've done that the last couple of years. I've spent, uh, last year I did a two and a half hour Zoom uh, session on the pilgrims. So I can go quite, quite long with, uh, that was my short course. Uh, I can go quite long on the pilgrims. We won't be doing that today. Uh, so we'll just hit a few highlights. The true pilgrims, we'll start off kind of introducing the pilgrims for a moment. The true pilgrims aren't as they are portrayed in the media. We usually see them as these people dressed in black and white, and uh, usually they don't have smiles on their faces, though, and they're, they're wearing buckles on their hats and buckles on their shoes. And that is not what the pilgrims are about. The pilgrims, uh, well, they, this is what their home uh, would have looked like in, in Plymouth. Uh, this is actually the Plymouth Plantation uh, recreation uh, in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And um, this is what they would have looked like. They were uh, farmers. They were uh, 15th, uh, late 15th, early 16th century uh, farmers, and they would have been dressed that way. Here's a, a, a woman. Here's a, a farmhand uh, dressed appropriately. Uh, here's one of the leaders of the colony. You will notice that even though it's faded, his outfit is actually yellow. How many men wear yellow today? And, and look at these folks, the, bright, the, the blues, the greens. The, uh, they love colors. They love style. They love their ruffles. And they love to play games. They love to laugh and joke. All of this is recorded in, in Bradford's uh, account of the Plymouth Plantation. So we have not been taught well on our, uh, our pilgrim forefathers. They were extraordinary people. They were ordinary people, but they were extraordinary people. We're going to start our journey today just hitting a couple uh, points in, in history. One is the Protestant Reformation in 1517, where Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, he, uh, God revealed to him er errors in the Catholic Church and Catholic teaching and practice, and he came up with 95 different, what he called theses, uh, points that he wanted to argue and debate with, uh, you know, he was also a college professor, so he wanted to deba debate these issues with his contemporaries. So he nailed these 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, and somebody came along, pulled it down, made thousands of copies on a Gutenberg press, and distributed it all over the place, and that was the spark that lit the Protestant Reformation. Then we're going to uh, move up in history a little bit to King Henry VIII. And King Henry VIII uh, reigned from 1533 to 1547. And we're bringing him up because um, he, you may know that he actually had seven different wives. I believe it was seven. 
And the reason for that is he wanted a male heir to take over the throne when he, when he died. And the woman that he was married to couldn't have children. And so he wanted a divorce, which wasn't allowed in the Catholic Church. And so he petitioned the Pope. The Pope said, no. So he said, okay, Pope, how about if we just annul the marriage and pretend like it never happened in the first place? No. So King Henry says, well, I'm king. I should be able to do whatever I want to. So if the church isn't going to work with me, I won't work with the church. We're breaking ties. The Catholic Church in England will no longer be the Catholic Church in England. It will now be the Church of England called the Anglican Church. And by the way, I'm going to be the head of it. So he became the head of both the state and the church. Now, this uh, opened the door for the Protestant Reformation to come into England. Now, we're going to skip up a few years to James I. And this is King James. This is the King James of the King James Bible. And he reigned from 1603 to 1625. And this is where we head into our time of the pilgrims. He's been called a tyrant king on steroids. He was the foremost proponent of what's called the divine right of kings. And the divine right of kings is where a king isn't subject to man's authority and laws and accountability. You know, in our country, who rules our country? Uh, yes, we do. And it, well, actually, it's the law. We have the rule. Well, <laughs> there's, there's what it's supposed to be and what it is, but we won't get into that. But we have the rule of law. It's the law that rules us in every person is under that rule, but not so under the divine right of kings. The king can basically do whatever they want, and they're only accountable to God himself, and that loosely, as representative to both the state and the church. And so he claimed himself to be a devout Protestant Christian. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm Protestant, and yet he was obsessed with hunting down and destroying the most devout people in his realm. So that leads into what's called Puritanism. There were people who uh, were, who were uh, birthed, if, well, their, their beliefs were birthed in the Protestant Reformation, and they saw the Protestant church, the Anglican church uh, in England, but they said, you know what? Uh, okay, it may be Protestant, but it's, it's really almost exactly like the Catholic church that, w that we just left. We want to purify the church. We, we, want to, we don't want to just preach homilies. We want to actually preach out of the word of God. We don't want to, uh, you know, we want to worship God. We, we, we don't want somebody else to take communion for us. We want to take communion. Uh, and so that was the beginning of Puritans, Puritanism. And um, the Puritans wanted extensive reform, and they sought to pure, purify the Anglican church. The Puritans were willing to accept things as they were for a long time and remain in the church till reforms might eventually happen someday. They weren't willing to break the law and leave the church. Well, there were some, some Puritans that that wasn't enough for them, and those were called separatists. And the separatists were Puritans, but they were concerned with this long delay in reform, and they decided upon what they called a reformation without tearing for any. They didn't want to wait. They didn't want to wait around. Now's the time. Now's the time. And they felt that the Puritans were wrong to wait. And so you had this tension in the church. You had this division in the church, even amongst those who wanted to reform the church. They felt the Puritans were wrong to wait and to accept error in the church. And these separatists refused to accept or be associated with the state church. And they, so they began to form voluntary congregations based on a covenant with God and with each other. This idea of covenant is really uh, important. So, and they sought a more simple, pure, unrestrained zeal to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. Church, they believe that churches should be made up of those who are sincerely saved and committed to Christ and are willing to make a covenant or commitment to each other. They believe that true churches should allow people to join by their own free will and be independent of ecclesiastical organizations. And so this is the beginning of what's called congregational churches. Now, it's hard for us today to even... You know, to realize how incredibly radical these ideas were. I mean, as I'm reading these off, you may be thinking, well, duh, right? 
Duh, I mean, that's, that, that's a no-brainer, that's, that's basic. But in this, in this time, it was incredibly radical. A national church, a single national church, is what held society together for over a thousand years. And these people were coming along and saying, we don't want that anymore. That's how radical it was. And to separate from the church that had the king as its head was not only considered heresy, but it was also treason against the crown. In 1593, it became illegal to be a Puritan or a separatist. So there were a group of, of uh, these uh, separatists who began a meeting in the, in the northern part of England in a little town called Scrooby, and they met in the, uh, in, the, in the manor house of a gentleman named William Brewster. And by 1606, they decided they were officially going to create their own church, the Separatist Church of Scrooby. And this was unheard of. What do you mean you're going to start your own church? You don't do that type of thing. And yet they, they were bold. They were bold to go outside the box to do what the Holy Spirit was telling them to do, not what their religious practices and traditions were telling them to do. And six, so they wrote a church covenant affirming church self-government apart from the official church. And William Bradford said, those reformers who saw the evil of these things, that's, that, that's all the religious practices of the, of the state church, and whose hearts the Lord had touched with heavenly zeal for his truth, shook off this yoke of anti-Christian bondage, and as the Lord's free people joined themselves together by covenant as a church in the fellowship of the gospel to walk in all his ways made known or to be made known to them according to their best endeavors, whatever it should cost them. Are you zealous for the Lord? Are you willing to do whatever it will cost you? to be zealous for the Lord. They were the Lord assisting them. So they met in secret by candlelight for four years with their children acting as lookouts. But they, but they you know, before too long, they, they figured out that this can't continue. They've got to make a decision. Either we're going to be all in and worship openly, worship freely out in the open, and suffer the consequences, you know, eventually be caught and imprisoned. Or we're going to need to escape and make a strategic retreat out of England. But in doing so, it was their intent to eventually come back after they developed a community of faith, to come back and one day set their friends, their families, their church, and their entire nation free from this tyrant. It wasn't an easy decision to leave, William Bradford says, feeling constrained by God to leave their native soil and country, their lands, their possessions, and all their friends and familiar acquaintances, to me that resonates with the calling of, of Abraham when he was told to leave his home, his people, his nation. It was thought to be a hard and unbelievable choice by many people. But in addition to that, to also go into a country that they didn't know much about, which was Holland, except by rumors where they must learn a new language and earn a living when they didn't know how they would do it. It being a pleasant place, but subject to the miseries of war, and that was a war with Spain. It was by many thought an adventure almost desperate, a case intolerable and a misery worse than death, especially seeing that they were not acquainted with business and commerce by which that country survives, but they had only been used to a plain country life and the innocent trade of farming. But these things, I love William Bradford because he, he spells out these horrible uh, situations in his quotes, and then he comes back and says, but it's good. It's all good. He says, but these things did not overly discourage them, though they did sometimes trouble them. For their desires were set on the ways of God and to enjoy his ordinances. But they rested on his providence. And providence means God's intimate control, God's perfect plan. And they knew whom they had believed. And when our backs are against the Red Sea, 
I think sometimes we forget who we, whom, in whom we have believed. We forget who he is. We forget his, his sovereignty, his power, and more than anything else, we forget his love for us and how much he wants for us. Well, I may uh, kind of skip along here a little bit, uh, but uh, the, they made a couple uh, unsuccessful attempts to escape Holland uh, where there was uh, religious freedom. Uh, finally, uh, there was a, well, there was a situation where the, the women and children, well, no, I'll go ahead. On the second attempt, Half the men escaped on a Dutch ship. They were on the ship, but with no money or clothes because the, their possessions were on the shore waiting to be loaded on. And then all of a sudden, the authorities showed up, and their women and children were still off the boat, and they were captured. And the, the, the ship captain said, oh, I ain't hanging around here. So, the, so he, he took off. So, so these men took off with, with no clothes, no money, watching their, their wives and children on the shore being arrested and taken away to jail. Can you imagine what that must have, you know, felt like? And then, on this, so now the ship is heading towards, uh, towards the Netherlands. It should have only taken two or three days at the most. The mother of all storms came up. It took them 14 days to make it to the Netherlands. For seven days, they didn't see the sun, the moon, or the stars. And they were driven close to the, uh, close to the coast of Norway, and the experienced sailors feared for their lives with shrieks and cries. And the ship, at one point, was totally capsized, turned over, and was covered by the sea. And they were sinking without hope. Without hope of recovery. And this is what William Bradford says. He said, but when man's hope and help totally failed, the Lord's power and mercy appeared in their recovery, for the ship rose again and gave the mariners courage again to manage her. And at the risk of sounding like I'm bragging, I would like to tell you about the fervent prayers of the separatists as they cried out to the Lord in this great distress. Some of them were hardly distracted when the water ran into their mouths and ears and the mariners cried out, We sink! We sink! These separatists cried out, if not with miraculous faith, at least with a great height or degree of divine faith. Yet, Lord, you can still save us. Yet, Lord, you can still save us. And with such other expressions as I will not share at the moment. When they did this, not only did the ship recover, but shortly after this, the violence of the storms began to calm down. And the Lord filled their afflicted minds with such comforts that most people cannot understand. And in the end, brought them to their desired destination and rest, where the people came flocking to see them and the ship, admiring that they had been delivered. The storm having been so long and horrible that much damage had been done, as the ship's captain's friends told him in their congratulations. And we find out from another source there were over 100 ships that, were, that perished in that storm. And this ship was the only one that survived. Yet, Lord, you can still save us. Even when the waves are crashing over us, even when there's water running in our mouths and into our ears, yet, Lord, you can still save us. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that the Lord can still save us? Do you believe that he can still raise us up out of the dust and out of the circumstances that we're going through right now? Amen. We've got to hold on to that hope. In the midst of hopelessness, we've got to reach up and grab the character of God, that he's a good God, that he's a loving God, that he won't leave us, he won't forsake us, he won't, he, he won't leave us alone. As a matter of fact, he may in fact be drawing Pharaoh with a hook in his mouth right into the trap. We don't know what may be going on behind the scenes. We don't know what God's plans are. 
but they're good. They are good. Well, I'm going to uh, skip right, right along here. And, I'm sorry? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so they moved to Holland, lived there for 12 years, but they decided that they could not live there any longer because the work was too hard. They couldn't get jobs because they were farmers and uh, Holland was, a, a, or at least Leiden Holland, was a place of business and it was a university town and, and so they couldn't get jobs with the, with the guilds, with the trades. And so they had to do menial work and their kids had to, to work in, er, in order to put uh, food on the table. So the, the work was too hard and their friends from England wouldn't come over. The, the friends in England would rather stay under the religious oppression in England rather than come over and suffer hardship. What price do we put on freedom? Well, that's another message. But there was another uh, reason. Uh, the separatists saw that their children and future generations would be in danger of degeneration and becoming corrupted due to the living conditions and the great immorality of the Dutch youth, and the variety of temptations and evil examples. It was a very secular type environment, and their kids were falling away from Jesus. But the last reason, and the most important reason, that, uh, that Brad, Bradford gives us, and uh, let me move ahead here. There's Leiden, and they're, they're leaving. Lastly, and not the least, they had a great hope and inward zeal of laying a good foundation, or at least making progress towards laying a good foundation for the spreading and advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ. Where? Not in Holland. Not in England. Not in France. In the remote parts of the world. Yes, though they should be only stepping stones for others in future generations to perform so great a work. They had a missionary call to the Native Americans. They were full of zeal and a great hope that God would work through them for that purpose. But it, it came with a cost. It came with a cost. See, there were other colonies that had been started, like Jamestown in 1608, that before too long, had, they were surrounded by Indians, the water was brackish, they had, didn't have a good source for food, they ran out of food, they were starving, and they went through what was called the starving time. And they were eating their, their animals, their, their pets, then they started eating their shoe leather, and eventually they ended up eating each other. Then they heard about the lost colony of, of Roanoke where uh, the, the people in the colony just disappeared. A ship went away for supplies, was, uh, to bring back supplies was delayed by the time it came back. All the buildings were still there. They weren't burned down or anything, but all the people disappeared. And to this day, we still don't know what happened to those people. The separatists heard these stories they had to face the reality of what they might experience. William Bradford gives us a hint of, of, of what they had to face or what, what they thought they would have to face. Now understand, I'm going to be speaking what William Bradford said. I know it's not political, cor politically correct. I get it. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, just reading. There were going to be few civil inhabitants he said, there are only savage and violent men which have no permanent dwellings, but travel up and down the land, differing little from the wild beasts. There's a continual dan danger of the savage people who are cruel, barbarous, and most treacherous, being most furious in their rage and merciless when they overcome others, not being content to just kill and take away life, but also take delight in tormenting their victims in the most bloody manner that may be. They were likely to experience famine, nakedness, and the lack of all things. 
and the change of air, diet, and drinking water would infect their bodies with great sickness and terrible diseases. They didn't have enough money to pay for such a voyage and to buy all of the supplies that they would need. They had to borrow the money, which they spent years paying off. And how would their supplies be replenished in the future after they arrive? There were many previous experiences of, uh, of other colonies. And it was hard enough moving to and adjusting to Holland, which was a civilized country. This would be much harder. And all of this caused many fears and doubts. But once again, William Bradford comes in and said, but the leaders and wisest in the group answered these concerns by saying that all great and honorable actions are accompanied, not maybe, but are accompanied with great difficulties. If it's going to be a great and honorable thing, it'll, it'll most likely be accompanied with great difficulties to match it. And these actions and difficulties must be both attempted and overcome with responsible and appropriate courage. It was granted that the dangers would be great, but not hopeless. The difficulties were many, but not unbeatable. All of them, through the help of God, by fortitude and patience, might either be accepted or overcome. And so they made the trip. And it was a difficult journey. There were 102 passengers, 30 crew members. They were made up of family units. Men, women, and children, that's unlike uh, other colonies that uh, almost exclusively had men seeking their fortunes. These were family units. They weren't go going to make their fortune. They were going to make a nation. And of the 102 passengers, only 52 of those were separatists. The other approximately 50 were what they called the strangers. And they were, in, they were indentured servants as well. And it was a rough voyage. The second half of the voyage tossed them around. They were blown off course 300 miles to the north of their, de their destination. The original destination was what is today in the New York Harbor area on the, on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River, if you're familiar with that area. But they were blown 300 miles off course to, what, to the area today that we know as Cape Cod. Their journey, which should have taken three weeks, became 66 days. And all 102 people were confined below decks because of the storms. They were confined below decks most of the time in a space no larger than a volleyball court. And a space smaller than this stage. And in that same area, there were their belongings, their supplies, a few chickens, a couple of dogs, and a 30-foot boat. And the ceiling was so low, I've been on uh, what's called the Mayflower 2, and it's a, it's a recreation of the boat. And uh, they, make the, they make the ceiling a, a little bit higher for us modern folks, but the, the original ceiling was really low. So for those 66 days, they were walking around like this. Yeah. Can you imagine what that does to your body? And there was no privacy in their times of sickness and personal matters. Uh, they did build some simple wood dividers, nailed them together, but it, it didn't give very uh, much privacy at all. Uh, their bathroom uh, duties had to be done in chamber pots. And, of course, in a, in a storm, chamber pots tend to move back and forth. And, of course, in a storm, you tend to have seasickness and throwing up. And it was a real mess. There were no showers or baths. And three women on board were pregnant in their last trimester. Yeah. So they stepped onto Plymouth Rock on Christmas Day of 1620. And God had prepared their location. The, the site that they chose was a, a Pawtuxet Indian village, but in 1619, a plague had mysteriously wiped the tribe out. And because of the plague, the other tribes in the area were fearful to come near the place. So when they arrived, there were no hotels. There were no friends to welcome them. There were no towns to get supplies. There were Native Americans that were shooting arrows at them. The crew was muttering about leaving them behind. There was little hope of receiving adequate supplies and relief. Bradford says, what could now sustain them? 
Okay. What could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? So, I'm going to sk- skip through. They, uh, they formed the, uh, the Mayf- what's called the Mayflower Compact, which was the first time that a group of people came together voluntarily creating a government and then voluntary sub- voluntarily submitting themselves to that same government. First time in history. And the Mayflower Compact, in the Mayflower Compact, they clearly said that they've undertaken this task, this, this trip, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And it was more than just a, a uh, setting up a government. It was actually what's called a covenant. They covenanted with each other, but they also covenanted with God in the presence of God to create a new nation for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith. They made a covenant with God that our, that our country is still under. We may not remember it, but God does. God will still honor his part in that. So it was a tough winter that they went through. It was foul weather. There was a variety of sicknesses. In the first 90 days, about half of the 102 settlers died. Sometimes two or three per day. Of the original 18 adult women who came over on the Mayflower, 14 of them died in that 90-day period due to caring for sickness and protecting their children from the cold. Half the crew died. In the worst of times, there were only six or seven reasonably healthy people who cared for the others who were sick. And in March, the captain pleaded with the remaining settlers to get on the ship and return to England, but they declined. Every one of them stayed, including the remaining strangers, believing that they had come for a great cause and purpose. And if they were to die in the wilderness, so be it. Well, I'm going to skip through Squanto. Fascinating story about Squanto, but he'll have to wait for another time. But he, uh, Squanto was uh, an Indian who had been kidnapped twice, once to England, once to Spain. And when he went to England, he learned English. And when he went to Spain, he learned Jesus Christ. And he returned and his tribe had died from the plague. And then when the pilgrims showed up, he decided to live with the pilgrims and to help them. And it was because of his help that they were able to survive that first winter. So they built a, um, a common house and they built homes in that, uh, in that first year. They were able to survive And, and th- actually thrive. And so Governor Bradford appointed a day of thanksgiving. He invited the nearby Wampanoag uh, Native Americans to celebrate and give thanks to God with them, even though they didn't yet know the one true God that they were giving thanks to. And perhaps this was William B- Bradford's attempt at an evangelical outreach. Chief Massasoit and 90 of his men came and feasted with the pilgrims for three days. They brought five deer and, uh, to give to the governor, and they ate deer and turkey and fish and lobster and eels, vegetables, cornbread, herbs, berries, pies, and other items. The Native Americans taught the pilgrims how to make popcorn. And the pilgrims and Native Americans also competed in running, wrestling, and shooting games. So William Bradford finishes up his account of the Plymouth Plantation with this quote. Thus, out of these small beginnings at Plymouth and with the pilgrims, greater things have been produced by God's hand, which originally made all things out of nothing and continues to give life and existence to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand candles, so the light that has been kindled here at Plymouth has shown to many people. Yes, in some sort of way to our whole nation. Let the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. So, 
In the face of hopelessness, these separatist pilgrims not only found hope, but they lived a victorious life. They started a nation. They began a heritage. There are 35 million people today that claim to be descendants of those original Mayflower separatists. 35 million, including U.S. presidents. They provided a set of core values and characteristics that have made us who we are today. And let's just go through those really quickly. They had faith in a sovereign, all-powerful God. They believed that God was in control. That he was all-powerful. They knew whom they had believed. They were convinced of God's goodness. They had a fervent zeal for truth, not for religion, but for truth. They had what's called a providential worldview, which basically means that they believed that God was intimately involved in all things, that he had a plan that he set before the foundation of the world. He already knows what's going to happen. Remember, they came out of a Calvinistic background, predestination. But they believed that God was in control, that they were players on a stage, if you will, participating with God in his work for the time that he allotted for them. But they understood that there were many that came before them whose, whose decisions and, and lives contributed to their life, who they were. And they understood that there would be others after them who would benefit from their decisions and the choices that they made. So they had an eternal identity. They understood that they weren't just you know, kumbaya Christians. They, they understood that they were kingdom ambassadors and that they had a dominion mandate. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. They had a purpose and an identity. They knew that they were on the earth for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And they had this generational perspective, understanding that they were stepping stones for others that might come after them. And they had patience. They were willing to wait for God's timing. I think that's the hardest thing for us right now, is to wait for God's timing and not insist on ours. And they had courage and fortitude. And they understood that they were citizens of heaven. They were not citizens of earth. In Revelations, it says, Revelations 12, it says that in the last days that the Christians will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. And that is... That really is a good scripture for the pilgrims. They didn't love their lives, even to death. They loved God more than their lives. They valued freedom over safety. How important is our freedom? What's more important, our safety or our freedom? And they had covenant relationships. They had a commitment with God and a commitment with man, and they were committed to each other, and they had a commitment to meet together regularly, whatever it may cost them. And they understood that they were a remnant. God kept whittling down, whittling down their, uh, their numbers, and yet God did great things through them. So, I will finish up And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel, sh Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. 
so I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. May it be so, Lord Jesus, even today. Let's pray. Uh, The uh, worship team can come on up. Father, I, I thank you uh, for your word today. I've, I've felt your spirit stirring, stirring in me, that you have a, had a message for your people today, and I pray, Lord God, that we would uh, be in, encouraged, that we would be encouraged in times of hopelessness to, to rise up and to hold on to these truths and to internalize the, the, just these values and these character traits and that we would believe in you, you, that you are a good God, that you are good, and you have good for us, that you have ne- never left us nor forsaken us, that you will rise up, and that you will be honored over Pharaoh, whatever that may mean. We bless you and thank you and dedicate ourselves to you. Help us, Lord God, to be those separatist pilgrim Christians. In Jesus' name. Amen.